Okay, yeah, thanks a lot, Alistair. Yeah, so what we're going to have a look at today is yeah, alternative innovative timber product solutions. So I'll have a look at more from the um, from the engineered wood product sector, and then when I'm finished, Ian will um, give another presentation on what the, the frame and trust sector are doing in, in this space as well. I suppose before we start, it'd be good to spend um, a couple of minutes <clears throat> just um, on an overview on what's happened and why we've got this the timber shortage especially. Really, it's, it's sort of become the perfect storm. And if you look at the factors that are up on the screen, they're sort of in, in chronological order. So it all started with the 2019, 2020 bushfires that swept through the country. They destroyed a lot of native forests, but they also had a significant effect on um, plantation forests. In New South Wales, they say that up to 40% of the plantation forests were affected by the bushfires that came through. Then just as that was finishing, COVID hit. So we sat there, we finished the bushfires into COVID and straight into lockdown. And at the beginning of the lockdown, all the economists were actually saying that there was going to be a huge Australian housing market slump or a worldwide housing slump. So what this did was this actually got people and suppliers and all manufacturing facilities, one, some of them had to close their doors, so supply was constrained a little bit, but also a lot of the um, importers and distributors wound back their um, stock levels just based on what all the predictions were going to be. We found that that actually happened for one, only one or two months, and then we started coming back and we had a, um, that's when the Australian housing boom started. So if you look at the graph on the um, bottom left of the screen, you can see the solid line at the top there. That's actually that housing starts that come through. So the dip that, the dip that came sort of finished around March 2020, March, April, and then you can see it's, it's an almost vertical rise that's coming through. So just a huge housing demand that came through. The US housing demand was very similar. So the graph on the bottom right is the actual US housing starts. And you can see it's, it's a fairly similar graph that the, um, the Australian housing starts are. One thing to note though, is the values and the metrics that you're using there. The one on the left, the, the top of that dotted line on the left hand thing is 35,000 housing starts annually in Australia. Now that's private sector houses, that's from the, um, the Bureau of Statistics website. The graph on the right for the US housing starts, that's actually 1.5 million. So there's a huge, huge effect so as the US housing boom comes through. Then we had in, to add to that, in around September last year, most of the, um, the ports in New South Wales were closed for the best part of a month for wharf strikes, which meant containers were all backed up and um, a lot of people were sending containers to Brisbane and Melbourne instead. Uh, from there, we also had shipping issues, out, especially out of the US, where it's very difficult to find containers. As a, as a function of COVID, a lot of the shipping lines rerouted their vessels or um, stopped a lot of their vessels and parked them, which meant that the normal distribution of containers around the world was totally upset. And wherever they wanted containers, they couldn't get them. So then we thought, okay, we're almost getting out of this. And a big boat gets stuck in a little canal for, um, for a week. So that caused 420 ships to be backlogged through the Suez Canal in that one week. They were all let through in a day. And um, as far as the media reports, it was all over and everything was fixed. But the problem was those 420 ships all trans-shipped through Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, those areas. So there was a big rush and a big backlog at those other three ports. And even though that happened in, I believe, March or so this year, we're just getting to the end of that effect of that backlog. Uh, and then on top of that, a couple of other little things that happened. 
Carter Holt Harvey decided to exit out of the Australian market as an LVL supplier, which reduced the, um, the amount of LVL that came through. And there was a temporary timber mill closure in Queensland due to a fire in the factory. Now, the interesting thing about that is that that mill provides a lot of the feedstock for glue laminated timber in Australia. So that, that puts some, um, some constraints on glue lamb timber. So as you can see, basically the perfect storm that came through. And if we look at, what do we look at? What's hard to get? Uh, LVL, eye joist, glue lamb, framing, and even now some of the pre-prime timber is getting very hard to get. LVL, especially in the deeper sections. So all the, um, all the wholesalers and importers are focusing on trying to supply the main um, 300 deep, 240, 200 deep LVLs that are used in construction. So that in a way is foregoing some of those deeper sections which are used a bit less. So eye joist, not too bad. I think we've seen the worst of the eye joist scenarios and, and the, um, the distributors seem to be building up a little bit of stock or, or keeping on, on top of that. Uh, glue, glue lamb, as we said before, with the, um, with the mill fire and just the huge um, increase in housing demand. So is constrained. Framing, Alistair mentioned at the beginning, L, um, the amount of framing that we're importing is basically the same as we were pre-COVID and the Australian mills are running at full capacity. So, but just the, the increase in housing demand has meant that that still is constrained. And even the pre-prime timber, which historically, or which comes out of different markets to the rest, a lot of that comes out of Southeast Asia, South America and New Zealand, is still um, starting to get hard to come by. The other thing I suppose to note, which um, is interesting, is when you do get your timber, because there are so many different sources of timber coming in, just try and make sure what you get is compliant. So the products need to be made to Australian standards, and there are specific standards that are referenced in the NCC through the Timber Framing Code, AS 1720 Part 1. So your yeah, LVL, laminated veneer number, AS4357, glue lamb, AS1328, structural plywood, 2269, and solid timber has a number of different standards depending on whether it's visually graded softwood, hardwood, or machine stress graded timber. So the certification should also reflect what is being supplied. Uh, there are a number of products where we've seen that have come through where LVL for structural applications is coming through, but the certification is for a lower grade formwork product that comes through. So that doesn't really provide evidence of suitability as per the NCC, because you're not certifying the product that you're actually supplying. No. And this whole um, compliance issue has probably come a little bit more relevant recently as the building confidence report that came through has put building certifiers and building surveyors on notice. So there's been an, a number of um, certifiers and surveyors that are asking for a lot more compliance when it comes to um, building products that come through. So a couple of very easy things to remember on how to manage your timber supply, order early and be organized. So there are, the, the timber is available, and the timber is there, so but you need to manage your lead times and um, and change your expectations. Whereas 12 months ago you could order today and it could be delivered on site tomorrow. Um, now we have to look at ordering early and being organised, ordering as early as possible to ensure that you get it when you need it. The other thing that we've done and looked at is how we can optimise timber for better availability with the with the timber products that we've got at the moment. So, and I'll go through a couple of examples of that. <clears throat> One of those that we've, um, that we've looked at at Maya Timber is what we call our CMO beam. 
Now, this is used around low capacity applications where a solid beam is required. In floor systems, a lot of the time around stair voids, people want, they don't want an eye joist around a stair void, they want a solid beam so they could um, connect balustrades to a jib rock and um, just have good, good fixing points for your stairs and also for short span bearers. So in a lot of these applications, they're fairly low, low capacity, but in terms of buildability, we're looking at a solid beam being a lot better than an eye joist. So what we've done is we've just used a 300 by 45 my joist and packed it out on both sides with 18 mil OSB. So this creates a solid timber beam to allow all those things to happen. But the 300 by 45 my joist works structurally and the OSB packing it out helps with stiffness, but also allows for that connectability. And you can see, um, the photo on the right hand side. So these are replacing LVLs. So when your floor system gets delivered, they will actually be in the pack with all your other LVL beams that go in with your floor system. Another example that, that people can use or might see it's becoming a little bit more prevalent is plywood box beams. Now plywood box beams have been around for many years. So, and they tend, tend to sort of come in and out of favour. So essentially what they are is a timber frame, which is made out of either MGP or LVL that is sheeted with um, plywood. And if you, um, if you have a look at, or if you have a think about it, every single house in Australia probably has a type of plywood box beam in it if it has a plywood bracing sheet in it. So, ply brace or um, OSB bracing or any of those sheet braces are in essence a form of box beam in that they have a timber frame and they've got plywood um, on there. Good things about plywood box beams is they can be cambered. So you can actually put camber in there and help with those dead load deflections that come through. Now, if you wanna look at how to um, how to get your plywood box beams or what sizing or anything you need. The Wood Solutions Technical Guide number seven has span tables there for plywood box beams. So that's quite a good scenario which tells you all about nailing patterns and how to construct them and different span tables for different um, framing. So for MGP or LVL framing on there. If you want to get, go a bit further and have to have a look at the um, design of plywood box beams and how to, as an engineer, how to design them from scratch, the EWPAA has some good information about this. And on their website, there's a structural LVL and plywood design manual, which has uh, a couple of worked examples on plywood box beams in it. You know. Another interesting thing with plywood box beams is that you could incorporate the cladding as the web. If you had an external uh, timber cladding material, such as a, a shadow clad or a, or a plywood cladding, you could incorporate as the web of the box beam. Um, but as it says in the slide, be warned if doing that. So as an engineer, I'm a little bit hesitant to look at doing things like that, just from the fact that cladding historically is seen as a non-structural product. So you don't want that to incorporate the cladding and use that as a structural part of the box beam. And then in 15, 20 years time, have someone want to remodel the house and remove the cladding as that will then um, cause an issue with the structural suitability of the frame. Another thing that's been used with the LVL shortages that have come through recently is a lot of people are starting to use eye joists in um, different scenarios such as rafters and lintels. An eye joist, it's a much better use of the timber fibre. So if you have a look at an, an eye joist, even in steel beams, you can see there's a lot of um, universal beams being used. An eye beam is a very efficient section that comes through. So uh, if you are going to use these sec these um, eye joists as rafters or lintels, 
The one thing you need to make sure is that you've got the correct installation details and you're following the connect, collect, correct scenarios for that. So, and that's in relation to supports, tie downs, things like that. All major iJoyce suppliers have details for things like overhangs, um, the detail R26 there, connections at supports, uh, blocking, and how to achieve all that with iJoyce. So make sure that you, if you're using iJoyce as rafters or as lintels, make sure that you follow the right um, details for your supports and tie down scenarios. Cassette floor systems. I suppose one question of this is how, how is this actually going to save timber and, and do that? But it does in the fact that you get factory optimization of your timber. So you're not, you're not delivering loose sticks on site, which get, um, get bits cut off the end. We can actually use our computer control saws and optimize the timber out of long lengths. So we can save a bit of timber. There's less waste on site. So, and it's also much faster on site. So it actually increases that, that building um, speed. Now, cassette floors use both for mid floors and sub floors. You can see a couple of pictures there where we've got the, um, the bottom left, which is a sub floor job that was um, just put in recently. And then, um, and then the bottom right is a, a large unit complex, 130 units in, um, in New South Wales that are all done with mid floor cassette floors. So, and when we look at things like factory op optimization, you can see there are, depending on transport requirements and distances, there are ways that you can even optimize it more like the, um, what we call our, our super panel in the top right hand side. That's uh, I think 3.9 3 metres wide by 14 metres long. So one single panel that did a whole ground floor unit of a, um, a villa complex in one lift. So even things like cassette floor systems and cassette wall systems and that can optimise the timber. <clears throat> then we look at now, other options could be things like unseasoned hardwood or cypress framing. You know, back in the good old days, everyone was using um, hardwood or cypress framing or Oregon framing. So, and there are opportun there could be opportunities for F8 hardwood or F7 cypress unseasoned framing to come in in the short term. To, and it's a, a very quick supply option as no drying's needed. So, one thing to remember about this is you do need to detail for shrinkage because it is unseasoned, it will shrink as it dries. Uh, but it could be something that you could talk to, um, talk to your state associations and push them. I know a lot of the state associations are looking at, at ways that they can, um, they can supplement some of that short-term supply issues with these products. The main thing we've got to look at here is really managing expectations. So depending on what you're ordering and what size and, um, and what material, the lead times can be long. So um, supply, I believe supply is getting better, but we need to grow an in inventory. We need to grow stock on hand. So in terms of from the, from the distributor level, there's a lot of products in there which are coming in into the um, yard and then going straight out of the yard. So it's not creating that buffer that we used to have to allow supply of those, of all the different products. So loyalty counts for a lot. So pick one or two timber merchants or frame and trust plants. And you'll, I think you'll find that those people that have been loyal to those frame and trust plants are um, getting their supply a lot more regular. Uh, but the main thing is to get in early. So if you look at the planning chart down at the bottom, you know, as soon as, as, soon as you put that site fence around the, the block, there's a good chance that you know exactly what timber needs to be used in the, um, in the floor system and what needs to be um, the wall frames and roof trusses that need to come through. 
So order that rather than ordering it the day before you want it, order it as early as possible. So just cha change your thinking a bit, plan, 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 and um, think about you order a lot of uh, builders are ordering their windows basically as soon as they um as soon as they start because they know they're going to take a long lead time. So you could look at doing things like order your timber at the same time as you order your windows. <clears throat> so yeah, there's a couple of um, little memes there about the um, the price of timber that's coming through and that it's gone into the states. So we are seeing the price of timber in the United States was up to four times the um, the long term average. It's now dropped back and it's around twice the long term average, but still quite expensive. So that's the end of my presentation. So what I'll do is I'll pass over to Ian so he can start his presentation. Thanks, George. And uh, yeah, welcome to everyone today. Um, so we're just going to talk about today design optimization in timber and specifically the frame and truss segment um, in this presentation. So as Alistair sort of highlighted, I've been working with Prida for around about 20 years now. Uh, I'm the engineering manager and we really my function is to promote and educate efficient engineering design and compliance requirements to our customers and their builders. So that's part of today's presentation. So who's Prida? We were established in 1964 in New Zealand. The head office is actually in Melbourne. We've got a manufacturing plant down there. Primarily our key thing is our engineering design software. So we license the software to fabricators and they make frame, they design the frames and trusses and they also make them with manufacturing equipment. In addition to that, we're part of ITW. There's a number of other familiar brand names like Buildex and Pazlo that form part of that ITW uh, network. So today's presentation, we're going to focus on a couple of different areas, um, essentially just giving you an overview of how the residential frame and truss segment is serviced and what steps are currently being taken to optimise timber design solutions in this segment at the moment. We're going to have a look at some practical timber design solutions and at the end, some steel design alternatives as well. So if we look at the timber frame and truss sector and how it's serviced, You've got your engineered timber supply, so that's George and other companies like that that supply solid timber and design services into the off-site fabrication and construction. Then there's also a number of engineered trust design software systems such as us, MyTech and Multinail. And our core function is really to deal with those off-site fabricators. We try to leverage their expertise to design frame and trust component systems to supply the site for residential construction. So if we look at that in a little bit more detail, essentially the offsite fabricator takes the builder's plans, they create a 3D design model, the software designs those components using the relevant Australian standards. Those also, those components get sent out to uh, saws and into the factory and they get assembled in um, various types of manufacturing equipment. It might be a roller press or a gantry press and that eventually those frame and truss components get sent out to site. So what really the key message I think today is to leverage expertise in each of these different areas via relationships and communication. So each one of those, when you see jobs that go really well and smoothly and efficiently, all of these key stakeholders are working tightly together and there's clear communication lines between each of them. Okay, so really just leverage each, each one of those um, stakeholders um, expertise. So in the fabrication segment, they're excellent at creating geometric shapes, manufacturing frames and trusses and designing frame and trusses. However, they don't know too much about, you know, steel work and steel design. So that should be leveraged off the engineer. So if all those are working together, you get a really harmonized uh, job on site. So what expertise can the frame and truss segment bring? There's a long history and a lot of these guys in the industry have a long, um, you know, have a lot of history in, in the industry and they've got a lot of expertise in the residential frame and trust design solutions. They also have fairly advanced technology and equipment. So they've got linear saws, which can provide highly effective timber utilization through cutting optimization. So all of the components that are pushed out of the software, they can go into these software programs that the saws generate and they can basically optimize the cutting sequence for all these timber components. 
the software is also quite advanced these days and it has accurate load path mapping which can provide efficient beam and little design so as you can see here you've got a truncated girder that's sitting on the wall frame right over the top of this lintel if you were designing that without the software you might put a strip load on it however what the software can do these days is actually pick up the locations of these point loads and design the beam accordingly so sometimes when you use span tables from AS1684 you might get a look a less a more conservative design than using some of these design programs and so what are we doing um, we're providing training and guidance so the frame and trust segment can leverage off service providers such as us and Maya um, to be able to complement their existing knowledge base so during COVID there's been a substantial uptake in webinars and online technical sessions to keep the industry aware of design efficiencies to maximize the use of timber so some of the examples we're going to have a look at in the next couple of slides. Design optimization. So the software programs these days are quite powerful in the way that they can um, create truss shapes and geometric shapes and design them. So here you can see an example of a, a couple of different types of jack trusses. They can be formed in a number of different ways. And as you go through the sequence of the way that they're webbed from one to four, you can you can see that the timber savings that you're getting are quite quite um, um substantial as you get towards uh, removing some of these web profiles through the truss okay so you're getting up to 25 percent timber savings utilizing the y jack type approach rather than having webs throughout the trusses and by setting out web and panel locations as well the timber utilized in the trusses can be substantially reduced so you can see here this is a, a sheet roof on the left here and you've got an internal support and there's just few too many webs in this profile so by utilizing the the functionality of the software you can enhance these panel uh, distances between the trusses and reduce the amount of timber in the job so in this particular job um, these trusses saved about 13 or 14 percent of the timber okay and it it comes down to the types of trusses and the loads that are on them for sheet roofs there's no real reason to have trusses internally supported for sheet roofs you can see the deflection here is only about one mil in this particular truss and even by removing this internal support you're only going up to two mil for a sheet roof so for tile roofs you may need to go with a an internal support to reduce that um, deflection internally but certainly for sheet roofs and those types of jobs there's no reason why you can't full span up to 11 or 12 meters so valley set outs you know we're trying to educate the the industry to try and look at the way that they're sending out various types of components making sure they're maximizing the distance you can see here the first valley set here is too close to the girder so just trying to push those um, or maximize the spacing between those components to reduce the span and the number of components in the job which just creates design efficiencies and, and cost savings in timber and, and other elements so and also spacing of valley sets so while you need trusses at 600 mil centers um, to be deemed as a, a temporary support platform you can push the valleys out to 900 mil centers for sheet roofs you can't really do it for tile roofs because you you need that um, batten design for the tile roofs but you can push them out on sheet roofs to up to 900 mil because you've still got a, a relevant um, uh, suitable stable platform underneath by having your trusses spaced in 600 mil centers the design optimization for beams so we spent a fair bit of time uh, trying to um, educate the industry that the optimization can come through the depth of the beam okay so there seems to be a tendency to double up beams in a lot of different lintels and beam scenarios if you go for a slightly higher depth you get much better design efficiencies and cost efficiencies by utilizing the eye value of the beam so where that can sort of relate is the products like claw plated beams these are proprietary systems they can't actually be made on site because the claw plates that join these uh, members together are actually mechanically pressed in a factory so they need around about 20 to 30 tons of, of pressing to drive them home they can't be hammered or nailed on site because they actually damage the claw plates but what these can do is they can utilize smaller end sections of timber and vertically laminate them together to create a deeper eye section and that way you can potentially end up with smaller end section material creating a deeper deeper section beam on site muscle beams these have come back into favor a lot of people are dusting off their 
their butt joining machines um, and pressing machines. So as Je George said, there's some you know substantial issues with eye joists and GLs and LVLs over the last um, few months, and these have been utilised by plating and joining uh, shorter and smaller end section bits of material in the fabricator site to be able to supply uh, jobs to site. As well, there's functionality in the software to create, you know, open web floor systems and trusses and rafter trusses. So we're utilising these while they're typically not used in in uh, lintels and beams, just because of the LVL and, and eye joists that have been used over the years. Now there's starting to be a shift towards being able to design these components with a lot smaller end section timber um, and supplying them to site in wall frame applications. So there is the functionality in the software. It requires a few little design tweaks from the designers, but it is possible to do. And so what you can see is that these um, you know, lintels where they would normally be solid can actually be replaced with open web uh, rafter trusses. Other areas to look at, floor trusses, as George mentioned, the eye joists are sort of coming back on stream, but we've had a lot of people moving over to open web floor trusses, such as the, the metal web ones, which is the top one here, and the long reach, which is the timber web system down here. The good thing is, they're because they're open, you can run services and ducting and all sorts of things through there. And the other option to look at is really, this seems to be an industry thing to space trusses at um, or space floor joists at 450 mil centres, but you can actually increase it out to 600 and that just produces the number of components that you have in the job. But you just have to make sure if you if you move them out to 600 that you have a 22 mil particle board flooring instead of the 19 mil because that uh, has to take the unit point load that's designed for residential flooring. For top plates and wall frames, there's little things in the standard that can help you with the design efficiencies. Uh, this is one of them. So it, on small open, um, external walls such as doors at 900 mil, you can actually run these top plate stiffeners. So rather than having a, um, a prop stud each side of a lintel, you can actually run these uh, top plate stiffeners. And it's it's mentioned in the A1684, it's up to a 10 meter squared support area that you're allowed to use those underneath the top plate to stiffen it up for a, a concentration of load. And the software has that capability. So you can actually design these components and essentially what it does is take the prop studs out of each side of the, the opening and just reinforce the head with a, um, a top plate stiffener. In addition, um, you know, where pushers come to shove, utilising the shorter lengths, that some of, the, some of the shorter lengths are available at the mill. So some of the fabricators have taken to actually claw plating some of their studs and joining these shorter lengths of material with a pressed claw plate in their factory. And we've helped them to design and, and um, provide specifications on the design for these particular components. These claw plates can take some bending and shear capacity through the through the joints. Um, and so they, we use a technical sheet to send to the fabricators that they send out to site for compliance and, and sign off. Uh, wall frames, single top plates. A lot of the industry is, has become quite used to designing with double top plates and studs offset from the trusses. Not the most efficient and effective way. Uh, and it also creates its own challenges with tie down because um, you know if you don't have this tie down connected to the lower of these two top plates, you can create del delamination issues between the, the laminates of these top plates and you may have to put a supplementary fixing in there to be able to tie them together. So we're trying to you know offer the solution that just have a single top plate um, and have the studs directly under trusses. So the software these days has the functionality to be able to detect where the truss locations are and locate the studs directly underneath the trusses. And what that does, it just takes the bending and the shear um, designs out of that top plate and allows the, the a more optimised design because you can essentially remove the need for a ribbon plate around the job. And as well, there's things like noggings. Um, you know, a lot of people use the same depth and grade nogging in the wall frames as the common studs, but not necessarily needs to be the case. So noggins are not required to be stress graded, um, and you can have it doesn't need to be the same sectional size as the as the common studs. It actually allows you to reduce the size of these sections down to 42 by 35. So being able to utilise those little um, subtle things in the standards allows you to drop some of the grading specifications and you can use the higher grade timber in, in other components such as uh, 
uh, wall frames and, and roof trusses. Um, one thing with the wall, the noggins is that, you know, there needs to be a fixing for some of these components for plywood, um, for bracing sheets. So you just need to be a little bit careful that if you are reducing a, using a reduced section size, that you make sure that it's fitted to the face of the stud that these, the bracing sheets are going on. Or you can alternatively use metal strapping uh, in those situations. And where there's no other alternatives, um, you know, I've had a few fabricators that have had long lead times on GL beams. Uh, and so we provided some design solutions for steel fixing. While we generally don't have, um, you know, we use third party uh, design software for steel, we don't have it as part of the, the suite of uh, software that we send to our fabricators. But it is possible to do, and some of the guys that we've had have started to substitute some of these harder to get GL sections with with um, you know small section PFCs and find that they're reasonably cost effective. Uh, and we've just helped them with some connection and design fixing. So you can see here, pretty st straightforward. It's just series 500 um, Buildex steel fix screws. The steel fix screws can fix up to around about um, 10 or 12 mil through um, steel. So just pre-drill the timber and fix those steel fix screws into the PFC and then a blocking plate at each end and some timber fixed screws into the jam studs uh, on each end. And so those can get the fabricator out of out of uh, hot water sometimes if the lead times are too long on these GL17s. Um, the other option is like gauge C, C channel sections and those sorts of things which are um, you know hopefully not going to be commonplace as we start to see more timber flow back into the market, but certainly in the short term, it's helped to get a few uh, jobs out onto site. And that's it from me. All right. Thanks for that. Some great presentations. We've got some questions rolling in, so I'd certainly encourage uh, those uh, online at the moment. If you've got more questions for the speakers, please um, ask those. Uh, I'd just like to sort of say up front for everyone that, you know, the industry has been doing everything it can at the moment to try and find some solutions for these, I suppose, what we would call shortfalls at the moment. We do think it's quite a sort of a spike peak at the moment with this increase in uh, um, approvals and increased uh, interest in housing. And, and uh, we're trying to sort of manage that to, I guess, draw that, uh, you know, those housing stats over a longer period so that actually there's more work for everyone over a longer period rather than trying to push it all at this sort of a, at the, into a sort of, you know, a shorter time frame. So we've, we've really looked across that whole supply chain from the forest through the sawmill, through the frame and trust sectors we're talking about um, and looking at sort of new product solutions. And um, to be honest, there's, there's not a lot of wood back in the forest at the moment. Most of that's being used. George did mention that some green framing, hardwood framing might be available just to sort of supplement the volume at the moment. But there probably won't be a lot of that and it'll be used in quite specific applications. So your home would be built uh, traditionally with, with um, your seasoned pine, but you might use a little bit of green framing like for non-load bearing internal walls. All the sawmills are pretty much at capacity, as George said at the moment. So there's not a lot of opportunity to actually uh, to, to grow capacity there. And all the wood that's being that they've got is is getting out to the structural market where it can. And as Ian said, that uh, you know he's actually been uh, um, with the frame and truss sector and the other sort of um, technical people in the nail plate companies working with them to optimise. So we're we're certainly doing the best we can there. Look, a question there just to get into the questions. Um, and George and Ian, you can fire up your videos again if you want. Um, um, there's a question about when can things expect to get back to normal. Um, so I don't know what your views are, George or Ian. I, you know, as I say, we're certainly hoping that uh, you know things are starting to get a little bit more back to normal now. And if, if we can flatten out that peak at the moment, yeah, it should should make things a little bit uh, a little bit easier. Do you guys have got a comment on that? Yeah, like I said, I, I think we're. Um... The, the supply, we, we seem to be sort of keep, keeping up with supply at the moment. One of the big problems that we've got is the inventory stocks are so low. So we haven't got that buffer stock that, that we've traditionally had to, um, to fill, fill all those gaps there. So, and I think when the, um, it seems that the, maybe the builders have realised they've probably um, signed up way too many houses and bitten off a bit more than they can chew. So ho hopefully we'll look at how the um, how the building industry might slow down itself and and stage this work over a bit longer period, and that will increase the um, the capacity for the supply and the and the inventory to catch up. Yep. Thanks, George. <clears throat> 
We've got a, um, another question here, George, as you might be able to, to, to take on. Actually, a lot of people have liked this one. Um, seeing a lot of, it says, seeing a lot of red LVL supplied from China. Are you aware of this? And how can we be sure that this is AS compliant, even if it's stamped with AS compliance? Yeah, there, there has been a significant amount of interest from some of the Chinese plywood plants and, and they are bringing in LVL. And uh, like I said in my presentation, they're providing certification which relates to formwork uh, for the LVL. So it's di different sizes and uh, different grades to what they're actually supplying. I suppose the main thing to be, all LVL should be stamped with a, or branded. So you, you can actually get a manufacturing mark or a manufacturing number out of it. So as an example, all the Maya Timber um, LVL is stamped as my, my Span 13 or my Span 14 or my Span 15. So from that, you'll be able to find out who the distributor or who the importer of that product is. And then it's just a matter of asking them for certification and ensuring that that certification matches that NCC evidence of suitability. Thanks, George. And look, if you do have any concerns, certainly the Engineered Wood Products Association of Australasia is there with a technical group, so you can uh, you can contact them if you if you do have a concern about a different product. Um, we've got a question here, Ian. It's probably best for you. We're just about metal connectors. Uh, how well do metal connectors stand up to salty coastal environments over time? Eh, not good. Um, yeah, no. The, all the products that we make are Z two seven five. Oh, primarily most of the products we make are Z275. So that means they should be used indoors or internal enclosed environments. Um, so near salty coast, that's okay if you're using sarking and you've got closed eaves, so weatherproof eaves. Um, however, if they're external, yeah, you should be going to stainless or some other uh, hot dip galvanised or coated application when you're near the coast because the, yeah, the salt spray is quite aggressive and corrodes the products and uh, most of the, you know, the claw plates, multi grips, those sorts of things are, are all Z, Z275. So they need to be indoors, protected, um, and yeah, away from the weather. Thanks, Ed. George, we've had a, just a question here about your CMO product. Uh, someone wondering what does the CMO actually stand for? <laughs> it's, uh, it's very technical and it was done by a um, by myself as an engineer so there's no marketing involved <laughs> it just stands for co composite my joist osb <laughs> <laughs> very logical typical engineer <laughs> yeah that's right and while while you're while you're there i actually did see another question there that came through which was asking like if if it's around a stair void why don't you just pack out one side of the um of the beam with the osb and that is quite quite suitable to do in doing that. I suppose we're packing out both sides because um, in this instance, we're making stocks of these beams. So then we, we can um, just make full stocks of a solid beam. On the side of stairwells, a lot of the time you'll have joists coming in on one side and then the stairwell on the other side where you want to fix gyp rock to. So in many instances, you want both sides of the beam packed out anyway to fix hangers and joist hangers and then to fix jib rock. And I suppose the third thing that we looked at was just the, um, the factor that if you do put it on one side, then it's guaranteed that the carpenter that's put it in is going to put it the wrong way around anyway. So we thought if we pack out both sides, it allows them to put it in whichever way they want without any issues. Thanks, George. There's a couple of questions there just around um, standards for cross-laminated timber. Um, I think you listed some standards early on, George, for a range of different products. Um, I don't know if you guys want to comment on this one, but as, as I understand it anyway, it, in Australia at the moment, we don't have any specific standards for CLT. It's not mentioned in our engineering code at the moment, which doesn't mean you can't design CLT using that, that code. But important with CLT being a proprietary type product, if you want information around that to go to the supplier of that product, and there's there's a number of Australian suppliers of CLT now and a number of imported uh, CLT products, but the suppliers should be able to give you all of the technical and design information you need for those products. Did you guys want to add to that at all? No, I think it's a good summary. Uh, Alistair, yeah, the perform, you know, it'd be a performance solution rather than there's no deemed to comply in, in any of the standards um, that are used for residential framing anyway. And most of the applications I've seen for CLT has been 
you know, mid rise and, and like commercial, but um, yeah, I'd, I'd be um, yeah, utilizing the performance solution rather than a deemed comply for those particular products. Okay. There's a question here from James Dwyer about um, a composite portal frames considered as an alternative for residential construction. Now you might want to chat about that, George, since you've been looking at portal frames in residential recently. Yes, uh, de definitely. And it, it does come in, I suppose, we, Maya Timber has developed a, a, a MyBrace product, which is essentially a, a LVL post and beam um, to go around large openings to provide bra bracing capacity where there's not much walls and, and large openings. Uh, but that could also be a, um, a composite sort of plywood box beam section. And we've done a few designs for some um, housing in, in cyclonic areas over the years where we've used a, a portal frame made out of LVL timbers and then lined with plywood to create essentially a plywood box beam portal. Um, and that does save, um, save a lot of timber in the, um, in the construction, but it is fairly heavy in the, in the design stage when you start looking at that. So there's a fair bit of design that goes into it and you're normally manufacturing um, to a specific design. So it is fairly labour intensive. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks, George. Uh, there was a question there about um, from an anonymous attendee um, able to comment on the difficulty in obtaining non-structural pine. Um, here it was mentioned actually that's used quite a lot for the TAFEs in terms of their teaching to students. Yeah, but what have you found there right across the board? I think most of the timber that's out there at the moment, even the merch grade timber is getting used somewhere. Did you want to comment there, Ian? I'd know sort of, you know, yeah. you know about noggings and things like that and um, bracing and... Hmm. No, I think, look, there's a lot of um, most of the graded material, you know, it's, it's hard to get any timber at the moment. So th what they are trying to do is, you know, utilising F4 and those sorts of materials that sometimes can be, um, you know, utility grade product that comes out of the mills. So those are the sorts of things, you know, fabricators have switched from using P10 to F5 and sometimes using these F4 components that are falling out of, you know, the recovery lines that come out of the mills. But yeah, it is it is difficult because lots of these different lines are becoming quite difficult to source. But um, yeah, those are some options and using those smaller end sections as well. So sometimes some of these smaller end sections are, uh, can be available because um, they're not utilised in typical framing. So 90 and 70 is usually the, the normal size for framing materials, but some of these smaller end sections can be used for noggings. Yep. In a sort of an extension with sort of timber that's not normally used, the question here about um, unseasoned timber we spoke about before for the shortfall, someone asked, what about secondhand uh, framing, which in effect would be seasoned timber if it's secondhand from demolition yards, can they be restress graded um, from a secondhand timber point of view to whatever the stress grade might be? Um, yeah, they could be. Look, there is some standards that... Um you can sort of reclaim and, and regrade some of these timbers just depending on what sort of use and application it's been in. Um, you know, for commercial and those sorts of things, sometimes they cop a sub substantial downgrade. Uh, but if there's, you know, if the product's still in good condition and is able to be regraded and there's no use that, that can't be reused again as long as it's in good condition. And, you know, with hardwood, it um, tends, tends to get more... Um, you know, it tends to grade a lot better after 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 it's been in the roof for a while, um, but just as long as it's not cracked or uh, has splits in it, or all those sorts of things, that would be the key thing to just keep an eye on. I can't remember the name of the the, the code that relates to some of the reclaiming, but um, yeah, there is some opportunities to do that sort of stuff. Yeah, I guess as George mentioned in his presentation, it comes back to ensuring compliance. So you can't just mm. use a bit of timber unless it's been graded. So you would need to be able to demonstrate that that was the case. Um, certainly yeah. you could regrade it, but um, you, you would have to ensure that uh, it, it, it was um, fit for purpose. Um, she was a question there, where's it popped? Um, just on the, uh, something that's moved up the chart here, just on software. I've got a question here, I guess for you, Ian, um, just talking about the software that the Frame and Trust guys use. Ask, will engineers ever get access to the software, even if the software will not have the complete design suite so that alternative designs can be looked at, especially at the initial concept design stage? 
I guess there's other there's software out there that engineers could use, but um, yeah, you might want to comment on that. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. There's a lot of you know third party software programs that are available and able to be downloaded. You know, I use some of them myself. So there's there's other proprietary systems that that are in use. Trust, you know, us, my tech and Multinail kind of had the the uh, coverage on trust programs. And yeah, look, there is some, you know, that we've looked at um, models to to have um, software listed up externally on on our um, you know, application service provider type uh, sites. It hasn't been done yet, but uh, that's not to say it, it won't happen. But um, yeah, at the moment, the licensing system we have is purely to fabricators. Uh, we don't license it to external engineers and those sorts of things at the moment, but not to say that that uh, may not change down the track, but that's that's the way the current mechanism that we use. So, yeah, for engineers, the best thing is to try and find a fabricator that they can partner with and even just contact us. You know, there's not, it's not, um, we don't um, restrict ourselves from having contact with engineers we're quite happy to talk to them and, and help them design and even architects at some of the concept stages you know they've they've contacted us and and um, run some questions and designs for us and we we provide them with preliminary design concepts in some cases so that can happen but at the moment yeah the software is um, yeah purely only licensed for our, our uh, fabricators and licensees thanks for that <clears throat> And there was a question um, just earlier on, which would probably be worth sort of answering here about um, steel substitutes, I guess, while it's a little difficult to get some timber products. Um, yeah. what, what, what's your feeling there? Are they, are they just as hard to get, the question is, as currently as with timber? Yeah, look, some of, some of them are. Some of the section sizes we try and uh, stick to the ones that are, are reasonably freely available. But, you know, we're, I think um, a few of our fabricators that we've run those designs through, the lead times are still out on steel, but they're not as far out as they are on the GL beams, you know, talking three, four months on some of these GL sections. So, yes, both both are difficult to get, but some of these steel section sizes are, are more uh, readily available than, than some of the GL sections, especially at the moment. You know, I think George was talking about the, you know, the GL problems with the, the mill closing and the fires it seems to have impacted particular sections of those quite heavily so um yeah it's it's not as you know it's still not great but um the the steel sections we've found are uh, often more readily available than the gls okay thanks look we're just sort of finishing up on time now i know uh, there's a question here from danny earlier on about some new technologies like uh, optimized engineered lumber and oriented strand lumber out of new zealand and we would be seeing some of those uh, products in australia and um, i might just answer that I, look i think definitely in the future you will at the moment uh, probably our biggest issue is about access to fiber so as fiber becomes more available as the pressure comes off i think we'll see a range of new engineered wood products going forward um but look, I want to thank both the speakers today. It's been a fantastic um, webinar. So uh, giving people some good ideas about just how we uh, might optimise some of our framing solutions, particularly in the residential sector, while we've got this sort of current high level of demand. Um, but um, look, if you've got any questions, uh, um, feel free to come back, have a look at the Wood Solutions website, um, or come back and relook at this uh, webinar if you want to sort of follow up on any of the concepts raised. I do remind you that uh, all the webinars are recorded. So you can download those from the uh, Wood Solutions website. So our next webinar will be in two weeks time on the 3rd of August. And then we've got a really exciting case study on a new project that's just been completed, the University of Newcastle's Q building, which is a low rise commercial structure, which combine both CLT and glue lamb uh, in the construction. And we'll have a number of speakers who are part of the consulting team taking us right through that project from concept phase to construction. So make sure you tune into that one. So thanks everyone for uh, joining us today and thanks once again to the speakers and we'll see you all in two weeks time.